We're going to look at a lot of different scripture today. Everything that I haven't shared with you all year long, I'm going to share today. My voice, you know, last week I barely had a voice, and then it completely went away as the week went on. And so this week I have some more voice, but I lost some of it uh, to a good cause. Yesterday, do you know that uh, our Allen Eagles beat Lake Travis again yesterday, like insult to injury? <laughs> won their, won their uh, basketball tournament, uh, boys basketball tournament here in Allen, and beat Lake Travis to do it. So bad to be Lake Travis this week. Now... John 6, verse 35 through 40, is where we're going to share in just a minute. It's it's one of those foundational passages about Jesus declaring who he is, what he's about, what his purpose is in the world, and it's going to give us uh, some room to, to talk about some things today as we anticipate a new year. In a messy world, and man, 2017, of all the things we could say about 2017, 2017 has been a messy year, and in unimaginable ways and uh, so so much difficulty so much strife struggle conflict and what can happen when we get into messy things is that we can become paralyzed by the messiness uh, by the the fear and the hurt and the the struggle of it all and we become weary in it and we just we just hunker down and try to hang on to what we have and in the process of that we find ourselves stuck, stuck in the brokenness, in the weariness, in the messiness of this world. And what would it look like? And there are people who can spend years and years and years stuck, trapped, uh, stalled out in life. What would it look like if you broke free from some of that in 2018? What would it look like if you said, you know, I'm going to just drop in. Of all the choices I have in life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how doing things God's way might work. I mean, not just a little bit of God's way, but really throwing myself into God's plan and how he's declared it to be lived. I mean, you, you, you look at your life and you say, oh, I want a strong marriage. I want a marriage that's going to be blessed by God. I want kids that aren't just going to come to church when I'm dragging them with me when they're young. I want kids that are going to care about God and the things of God, God's church, when they're young adults, median age adults. I, I, want, I want my life to matter beyond today. See, you can, you can desire all those things, but here's what happens. If, if you're not spending time in God's Word, and you're not focused in on really meaningful prayer, and you're not involved in Christian community in a committed sort of way, and you're not involved in serving the Lord through the the mission and ministry of a local church, if you're not sharing your faith, then, okay, those are really foundational steps that make everything else come together and work the way God's intended your life to work. And if those things start falling away or they're not in place, then you may not end up where you intended to end up. We talk a lot about planting seeds at our church. There's a parable of the sower, and it's a, it's a great story. It's about a guy who... He's scattering seed all the time. Uh, I don't know what you've been doing over the last month, but here's what I've been doing. I've been binging. I've been binge reading my Bible. Now, this is, this is to accomplish a goal. And I threw it out to you months ago, and I don't know how much y'all keep score on this kind of stuff, but as a way of accountability. If I say it out loud, I feel more obligated to do it, and then I have to give you an update on how it's going. So my goal for this year was a little different in my Bible reading. I decided I was... I felt called of God to read the Old Testament twice and the New Testament three times in 2017. So I'm on top of that now because I'm a binge reader. And as I have binge read the Bible, uh, especially in this second round, really taking big chunks of Scripture at a time, that image of the sower, image of planting seeds... All through the Bible, it occurs over and over and over again. That, that what we experience is based on the seeds we have planted. What kind of seeds are you planting? You're not going to get something different than what you've been planting all year. And so if you look back across your year, 
Whatever you're harvesting right now is probably the result of seeds you planted or maybe failed to plant earlier in the year. But one thing about it, your lifestyle, your choices, and your current life situation, it's, it's all perfectly fitted to achieve the, the results you're currently experiencing. Now, you look back at last year and you evaluate those areas of your life you consider to be most important. You say, okay, well, did my marriage improve or did I lose ground? Uh, you, you say, uh, one of, those, one of the, the basic things that shows up in a lot of New Year's resolutions uh, for a lot of people, okay, we got to reduce our debt, we got to reduce our debt. Well, did you, did you make lifestyle changes? Did you adjust your spending in such a way that you could reduce your debt? Or did the pile get deeper? Is your relationship with your children at whatever age closer now than it was January the 1st, 2017? Are you enjoying the benefits of regular exercise, uh, that goal that you set? And by the way, I'm planning to be at the gym tomorrow. But for those of you who aren't going to be there on January the 2nd, don't go tomorrow and mess up my day. Just clear on out for us regular guys, okay? And has your spiritual journey, has it, has it yielded depth that helps you to answer life's big questions when life's big questions come up? Now... Everything starts with a step. Everything starts with a commitment. Everything starts with a decision to say, I'm going to do something different than what I've been doing because I'd like to get a different result than what I've been getting. So what is your next step? We say with God, with your family, with your career, with your friendships. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote this, Greatness is not in where we stand, but in the direction we are moving. We must sail sometimes with the wind, sometimes against it, but sail we must and not drift or lie at anchor. As we move into a new year, I want you to consider making some resolutions. Now, some of you have already thought of some, resisting some bad habits, starting some new habits, recommitting yourself more fully to some practice, some cause. But today, this is what I want to focus on. This is, you, you probably should write this down. It's not part of your outline, but you should really write this down. God is God. That's all I got. God is God. And God is God has a determining role in your life. He's not a consultant off on the side. He has a determining role, a determining plan for your life. <clears throat> the Bible says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. So what would your life look like if, if you really live this life according to God's plan. What, what if you said, well, instead of just making up my own plan, I'm going to follow the plan of the one who created me. He knows better than anybody else because he's the one who designed me. He knows how it ought to work out. What would your, what would your life look like if, if you made it your goal to, to get to know him better, to better understand his purpose for your life? Instead of, and this is the typical thing, even for people who are regular churchgoers who are professing Christ followers, don't most people say, I'm coming up with my own plan. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to self-define how life should work and how from spiritual life to everything else, and then I'm going to ask God to bless it. And I'm going to be really frustrated with God when it doesn't work out that way. Like, it's all God's fault that he didn't bless what was not his plan at all. So... We began 2017 with this, with this statement together here in worship hours. We, we began talking about what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And we said a follower of Jesus Christ. This, again, is one of those deep thought things you probably should write down. A follower of Jesus Christ. Obviously, no one even reached for a pen. That really hurts my feelings, but I set myself up. A follower of Jesus Christ is someone who follows Jesus Christ. Not even an amen to that? No, nobody's agreeing? Okay, two amens. They were both from preschoolers, and that's why they're here in the service today. Yeah, uh, a follower of Jesus Christ is someone who follows Jesus Christ. And on the other side of that, if you're not following Jesus Christ the way he has defined fellowship, discipleship, then are you really a follower? Of Jesus Christ 
and that's, uh, that's something we'll continue to work on in the discipleship stuff. Peter was a disciple, but even late in his life, he was still leaning into this life of following, what it looked like. Jesus is ascended back into heaven. Peter is still leaning into it. Here's what he said. This is in 1 Peter 2. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. What are your goals in relationship to following Jesus, being a disciple? Well, there's, there's going to be impact when you start following Jesus. Here's the kind of things that happen. Lives get changed, and wrongs in the world get righted, and eternity gets touched when you follow in his steps. And as you look back uh, on the last year, does any of that show up in your, in your list of, I planted seeds and now I've harvested some of that? Do, do any of those things, that are the, the big sweeping eternal things start showing up? Did faith really get inside of you and dig into the deep places of your life? Here's the other part. Did anything about your faith in Christ bust out into the world around you? Because when you belong to Jesus, one of the things the Bible talks about is that it's going to overflow into everything else and everybody else. It spills over. It's, you're not a self-contained Christian. We're a Christian that impacts the world. So, why did Jesus come? And that's what we've been talking about throughout December in our messy Christmas series. Why did Jesus come? Not just that he came, not just the Christmas story, but why did he come? And... This word comes from John the Apostle, John the disciple of Jesus, recorded in John chapter 6. And he is talking about Jesus. This is one of the great I am statements of John's gospel. I am the bread of life. This verse 35, John 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes me shall never thirst. But I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You might want to mark down verse 38. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I lose nothing of what he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him She'll have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. All about God's will. Jesus was about doing the will of his Father, and as we follow Jesus, what do we do? We do the will of the Father. We Christians have a distinct advantage in this particular part of spiritual life, especially with those far from God, when we're facing choices and decisions, and we're all making choices and decisions all the time, every day. When it comes to making those choices and decisions... We, we have the Holy Spirit in us to guide us, but we have a, a, a perfect Word of God available, so available to us. I, I'm amazed at how many people, who, I'm a Christian, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what's right and wrong. I don't know what choice I should make. When the Bible, over and over again, spells out in, in amazing detail, here's exactly what you should do. Here's what God expects from you. Here's what he wants from you. Here's the direction he wants you to take in your life. We have so much available to us. Clear, perfect information. But today, I want to talk about six specific things in his word. This isn't the beginning and end, but it's things that are God's will. You ever ask about God's will? Okay, 2018 coming up. What is God's will for my life? Well, I don't know all the specifics of everything for God's will for your life, but I know a lot of things because this book is full of guidelines, commands, direction for what God's will is. So those things aren't a mystery to us. But I just want to touch on six things quickly today that the Bible says this is God's will. So if you're wondering, what's God's will for my life? Well, this is God's will, these six things. Some of them will be easy for you. <coughs> Some of these things you'll say, where in the world did that come from? Here's the first one. Choose God's heart for the world. Just choose God's heart for the world. That's the first thing about God's will. It's God's first priority that everyone be saved. Every, how many? Well, thanks for still being here. Everyone. Everyone be saved. And he says it several times. Here's some examples. Uh, 1 Timothy 
that God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Second Peter, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Luke 19, we spent a whole Sunday on this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So the first point in God's plan for your life is that you be saved, that you come into a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And the way that you do that is that you say, I'm a sinner and I can't fix it. I can't save myself, not by religious stuff, not by my self-effort, not by any personal means. I need a Savior to be saved. And I believe Jesus is that one and only Savior. And I'm putting all my faith in Jesus who died on the cross for my sin and was raised from the dead. And I want to surrender my life to him. I, I want to turn over, the, turn over the reins of my life to Jesus. I want to, I want to follow his plan for my life. Not my plan, his plan for my life. And when we put our faith in him, believing Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead, that he is the, the sinless son of God, when we surrender our lives to him as the leader, master, Lord of our life, then God comes in and he takes away our sin. He cancels our sin debt. He opens a way out of the brokenness that is a, a sinful world and a sinful life. And he puts us on a new path to be restored and renewed back to what God originally intended for our lives. That we walk in a relationship to him. That one day we'd be with him forever in heaven. And that is God's desire for you. So... Has there ever been a time in your life when you gave your life to Jesus? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I got you here, and it's the last day of the year, and uh, I want to give you a chance right now. That's a great way to end 2017, to say, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I want to lead you in that kind of commitment prayer, because it's just you and God. Maybe I can give you some words to work with, to, to express your heart to God just now. So let's bow together. And maybe, maybe if this isn't settled for you, it's not sure for you, maybe you would pray right now. Dear God, thank you that you love me. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I want to turn away from sin. Today, I turn my life to Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was raised from the dead. Come into my life, Jesus. Take away my sin. I want to follow you. Surrendering my life to you with all my heart. I want to follow your plan. I want to live your design. I want to know when my life ends, I'll spend eternity in heaven. Thank you for this incredible gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if God wants everyone to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth, to come to a relationship to his to him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's just the beginning. Because see, we follow Jesus, and that's Jesus' heart. We follow Jesus, so we're going to care about the lost people around us. The people in our circles of influence all around us who don't know Jesus just yet. Maybe have never had an opportunity to hear the gospel story. So he wants to use you to bring others to a knowledge of this truth. As Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Our purpose in the world as Christians is going to follow Jesus. It's going to be identical to Jesus. It's going to be used to be used as his instruments to bring salvation to a lost world. So God's first priority is that we come to know Christ as Savior and then that we join him in that mission. Now, because that's, it isn't just that, that's for some people. That's for everybody who names the name of Christ. That's a part of your job description. So if it's part of your job description, what are you going to do with that? And you need to think of it this way, and this helps to define a lot of choices that we make. If your mission from God, God's will for you, is that you be reaching out to a lost world, then that's going to make a difference in the person you marry or whether or not you marry. It's going to make a difference in where your, what your career is. It's going to make a difference in, in, in every choice that you make in life. If that is the big picture, if this is what God wants you to be about, then it's going to affect how you spend your money, how you spend your time. Everything about your life is going to be directed by that choice how can I be more effective in this first priority now I have talked I've been doing I've been preaching sermons for 30 something years 36 years now and so I've talked to a lot of people about spiritual things over that many years 
But this conversation I've had hundreds of times, hundreds of times in a lot of different places, a lot of different contexts. People who said, well, I prayed about it, but it's really not, I don't, it's just not God's will for me to be involved in ministry or mission. Uh, I, I, that's just not for me. I prayed about it, and that's not it. But that same person will throw themselves into a hundred lesser things that have nothing that touches eternity about them. They'll throw themselves into that with a reckless abandon that they never prayed about. The only thing they pray about that God's always shutting the door on is the gospel. And that's just not quite right. It is God's will. God's will that we know Jesus as our Savior and that we make him known. So each Christian needs to apply this principle differently in different situations, but every Christian ought to consider it. Bill Bright, one of the great, he, a lot of people come to Christ through the ministry of Bill Bright. He said, every Christian should take inventory regularly by asking himself these questions. Is my time being invested in such a way that the largest possible number of people are being introduced to Jesus? Are my talents being invested to the full, to the end that the largest possible number of people are being introduced to Christ? Is my money, my treasure being invested in such a way as to introduce the greatest number of people to Christ? Now, how high is gospel sharing on your priority list for the new year? The people you know who don't know Jesus in your circles of influence, the people you're going to interact with on a regular basis or through the course of a year, how high is talking to people about Jesus, telling them your story, caring about their eternal soul, how high is that on your list of priorities? And I thank the Lord, <laughs> man, we started last January. I never would have imagined what God would do. You, you're you the craziest people I've ever run into. The, you, have, you have taken this on at such a high level, and so many of you doing it. Gospel sharing, of all things. There's not a church anywhere that's had more people dive into this so big in a year's time. And... God has done some dramatic things in the life of our church in 2017. And the 2017 held a lot of things for a lot of you. And I don't want to challenge you in 2018. If, 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 if you haven't really just started leaning into this and looking for the opportunities, experiencing the adventure of the Christian life, I want to encourage you. Let 2018 be your year. January the 20th is our next Great Commission training. It's a, just a Saturday. And it will equip you to be able, with a simple gospeling tool and with simple... Simple prayer strategy to reach people who don't know Jesus in a comfortable, non-confrontational, non-beat-them-over-the-head-with-a-Bible kind of way. And I want to encourage you to take that step in the new year. Now, that was the longest thing I'm going to talk about. The other six, the other, the other 15 things. How many things are in the outline? 15 things? They'll go quickly. Here's the second thing. Choose to live under the control of the Spirit. Here's what Ephesians uh, says. Paul said in Ephesians, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay, whenever you see that, you ought to perk up. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. And you know, debauchery sounds terrible, whatever it is. But be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. So this is the second revelation of God's will I want to touch on. And what happens is that Paul, in this passage, he puts these things opposite one another. Because he says, something's controlling your life. And this is something that controls some people's life. So if this is, and we all have, we all struggle against something that probably is pulling against God to control our life, to direct our life. This is the illustration that Paul uses here. And he says, just like being intoxicated, it dominates the choices that you're making. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to direct the way things go for you. What if the Spirit of God so covered you up that you were under the leadership, the control, the lordship, the Holy Spirit. When a person is filled with the Spirit, someone else controls them. And it's the Spirit of God. But how can we put ourselves in His control? What does it mean to live the Spirit-led, Spirit-controlled life? Well, first thing is to acknowledge anything that's keeping us from that sin. So we need to look at what those things are. What sins do we need to confess? What sin is out there that it, we're pulling against, that's really holding us back and keeping us from everything that God intends for us? So we confess our sin to God. To confess it to Him, He starts working on it in us. And 
It's not a matter of just an act of our will putting away sin. It's to lean into God. He starts taking care of that part. Then, second thing, to willingly yield ourselves to his control. So if the Spirit of God is to remain in control, we're going to have to cultivate an awareness and dependence on him. We're going to have to immerse ourselves in in God's word because the more you hear God's word and the more time you spend in prayer and focus uh, working on my heart with God prayer, uh, the more stable you're going to be in this, the more spirit-filled you're going to be. As Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then as we're filled with the Spirit, all our life decisions start running through that filter. It's not just me trying to grab out of the multiple choices of what I could do with my life. Everything in my life runs through the filter of what the Holy Spirit says and who the Holy Spirit is in my life. And my life starts to align with laser focus, God's will. Here's the third thing. Choose to live a pure life. For this is the will of God for your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. God's will is that we be holy, sanctified, set apart, uh, focused on God, dedicated to Him and to His priorities for our lives. And, uh, of course, God's plan for sexual expression, a man, a woman, together for life in a married relationship. And... uh, Outside of that, outside of that uh, God plan, things start to unravel and things start to get dangerous and things start to become destructive. And that's why it's God's will that you abstain from sexual immorality, anything outside of God's plan. Now, in the last several, I don't know if you noticed this, in the last several months of 2017, we found that sexual immorality is kind of a big deal in our country with some of the most prominent people in our country. And uh, those are the ones that just came to light because they're famous people and they came under attack. It uh, clearly permeates a lot of this land. And so if that's what's out there, a Christian who follows the will of God to stay away from that, to flee from sexual immorality, is going to stand out as a witness, stand out as an example, and have a great door of opportunity for influencing society. So what if we actually did this and lived the will of God in this particular area? It would tremendously amplify our testimony in the world. Here's the fourth thing. Choose to be thankful in all things. Here's why we have to do that. Because in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you (laughs) in Christ Jesus. So this is one statement of God's will that Christians find hard to accept. Because this is not how we work. We like to do it uh, like on uh, Yelp or something where you're just complaining about everything. You're shooting holes in everything. You, we, we love complaining and pointing out the deficits in a world around us. Here's what's wrong with that. Here's what's wrong with that. Here's what's wrong with that. And we do the same thing with God. God, here's what's wrong with, with my life. And this is where you're falling down the job. Here, 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 and here. And if you would correct those things, my life would be awesome. But unfortunately, God... You're not doing a good job on those things. So work on the deficits. And we're always looking at the deficits. We're looking at the parts that aren't working out the way we think they should work out because we're so uh, incredibly wise. We know how life should work. Not so much. And what we need to do is to be thankful. And Paul didn't mean that you just put on your happy face and pretend like bad things aren't happening. But God never wastes anything, anything. And so we want to be thankful for everything because God uses all things for his glory, all things to such eternity. So we're looking for where those things play out, to be genuinely thankful. Uh, The song, Count Your Many Blessings. Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. Count Your Many Blessings. See what God has done. Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Count Your Many Blessings. See what God has done. And as you look at those blessings, you, you start seeing well, there's a big pile of blessings. And they really overwhelm the deficits that I feel. This is why you should thank God in everything. Because we have so much for which to be thankful. We give thanks always in every situation for everything. It is the will of God. Here's the fifth thing. This one will rub you the wrong way. Choose to submit to authority. Wow, we don't like anybody telling us what to do. But here's what the Bible says. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it's to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God 
that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. It's God's will for us to submit ourselves to the laws of the land. And the reason, it's all about the gospel again. It's, it's just one way to shut the mouths of the critics and the people who are, who are watching Christians all the time to see if there's anything that's not adding up, anything that's hypocrisy about their lives, hypocritical about their lives. And so he says, this is a way to, to show Christians are different in a great way, in a godly way, in a blessed way. We toy all the time with decisions about this, about, about just compromising, a little here or there, because it's kind of a dumb thing anyway. Um, so I, I went through this process not too long ago. I was going to speak to a group uh, down uh, south of downtown Dallas at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay, well, if you're going to get to downtown Dallas at 9 o'clock in the morning, what time do you, on a Monday, what time do you leave? Right now. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's not good. So I was going, well, sure, even then, I got caught in some traffic, slowed me down, and thinking, okay, I have, I have a pretty good group of people waiting for me. They're expecting me to share something from the Word of God, inspirational and, and blessed, and I'm really needing to get on down there. And I finally broke free, broken free of the traffic, and I'm not going to make up some time down here now that I'm free of downtown Dallas. And uh, and I thought, or... I could do that and then be pulled over by a police officer and try to explain to him. Well, see, here's the thing. It's for God that I'm breaking the law and endangering other humans. And, well, that just doesn't quite work out, does it? That It starts affecting your testimony. So you start seeing how, uh, how, how this can play out. What do we do when we have poor laws? Well, you work to change the laws. But as long as they're on the books, God wants us to obey the law. The only time there's an exception to that is when the law directly contradicts what God's word says. You see that with John and Peter. Speak no more in the name of Jesus. And they said, you know, we're just thinking we're going to do what God said instead of you on that one. Uh, but that's, that's the only exception. Now, this God wills submissiveness to authority it's not just about government. Because the Bible also says, as employees, you should submit to your employers. It's a part of your testimony. Wives, submit to your husbands. It's a part of your testimony. That uh, as believers, we should submit to spiritual authority. It's a part of our testimony. That we should submit to one another as believers in fear of Christ. So submission is a, is a big issue that... Well, no, I want my opinion to be known. I want my way to be followed. I want, yeah, see, that's, that's really not reflecting Christ. And that's why we're called to live a different life than that. God wants us to be a submissive spirit. And the last thing, just choose to trust God. And whatever 2018 holds for you, choose to trust God. You know, this may come as a shock to you, but uh, God may have is a part of your 20, uh, 2018, he may have suffering as a part of his plan for you. Because it does factor into his will for believers' lives. Here's what, here's what we run into. Peter mentions suffering according to the will of God. He says in, uh, in 1 Peter, two different places, for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. If that should be God's will. Another place... Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, in these verses, we find the truth that may fall within God's will for a Christian to suffer. Because there's certain things you're not going to learn until life is hard. There's certain lessons about prayer and about the scriptures that don't become clear until, until there's hardship, until there's challenge to your faith. It's not going to grow you to be more like Jesus unless you encounter difficulties. Two passages from Paul fit alongside what Peter said in Philippians and then in 2 Timothy. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And then that passage in 2 Timothy is so convicting. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, it isn't might be. A lot of this is sort of uh, might be kind of stuff. This is a you will be persecuted. So if we 
are living godly lives in a godless world, there's a pretty good chance because they rejected Jesus, they may come after you too. You may have some pushback in your workplace, in your neighborhood, with your extended family. When you try to just faithfully, simply live the Christian life, because God's will is that we be drawn closer to Him and depend on Him, and He needs to put us in a spot where we're having to. So think about this. You look back on 2017, you say, man, 2017 was awesome. It just breezed right along. I never had any problems, never hit any bumps. Everything was smooth. No difficulties at all, especially in relationship to my faith. Well, you may not have been doing it right. You may have missed something somewhere. Because when you belong to Jesus, just in doing the simple, faithful, meek, and mild, submission to authority kind of life, you're going to run into some opposition. We're not going to probably uh, place before a firing squad, suffer in severe ways in our country for our faith. But maybe the reason it's been so smooth is because you haven't been living that godly life that's any different from someone who's a pagan. Maybe, uh, maybe your Christian faith was so internalized that none of it ever spilled out into the rest of the world in a way that was tangible to someone else. Now, when I talk about this and persecution and pushback, I'm not talking about being a Christian jerk. Uh, and if you're a Christian jerk... I don't want to make you feel bad. Well, I kind of make you, want to make you feel bad. But there are a lot of Christian jerks in the world who you just like to be abrasive and obnoxious and hateful and hate-filled, and that is not Jesus. So we don't want to bleed into that. It just damages the cause of Christ. I'm referring to living a godly life, graciously letting it be known. Not apologize, not ashamed of the gospel. I belong to Jesus Christ. And then accepting whatever comes. And sometimes there are going to be consequences to belonging to Jesus Christ. Because there's always a cost to true discipleship. Has, ask, your, ask yourself this question. I mean, ever, certainly 2017, but ever, has your, has your Christian faith ever cost you anything? Have you ever had to pay a price for doing what was right before God. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation. It's just a promise. In this world you'll have tribulation. I love the second half of that verse or else I'd have despair. In this world you'll have tribulation, but take heart. Because I've overcome the world. So here's six, six declarations of God's will for our lives. And these things are just guidelines to move things forward in a way that focuses on the things that are going to honor, honor our Savior. And they're going to bring wisdom to your life. And as we go into this year, you're going to make lots of choices at all kinds of levels. And what you do with the things that you know are God's will, they're going to determine, because God has a determining place in your life, they're going to determine whether those choices are the right choices our choices are going to have terrible consequence. My prayer for me and my prayer for you is that this year ahead be a year in which God's will is just bigger than anything else. And we get to see His glory because we leaned into His glory.